Sound. Excellent. Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Tall Buildings uh, Theatre. It's probably a grandiose uh, description for it. Uh, arena. It's probably worse. Uh, sponsored by the ASFP, and as you can tell by my shirt, uh, that's where I'm from. Uh, the Association for Specialist Fire Protection. Uh, so we're going to talk uh, briefly, uh, myself and the uh, inimitable Stephen Bond uh, from the GGF, about modern forms of um, compartmentation. Um, the interesting thing about pacifier is, is uh, pacifier is, uh, is sort of two schools of, of thought. Uh, one is um, you combine a series of products and methodologies to solve a problem, uh, or you actually have a product that solves the whole thing. And this presentation sort of falls a little bit on the latter. Uh, so what we're going to talk about, key learning points, lots of open questions there. I shan't read them out, I should be able to read it. Okay, so effectively here we have a couple of examples um, in terms of fire safety and the, I've got to read my, there we go. So the pictures one and two are Cleveland Tower in, in that day of Birmingham, which is sort of that way. Um, and this fire happened two weeks after Grenfell, uh, but it was contained and the spread of uh, the spread didn't, it didn't actually sort of spread from the compartment of origin. Uh, so not all fires of that time <coughs> result in obviously what we saw a few years ago. The one before, or the, the one on the right, is uh, Lackenall House, uh, which in London, uh, in 2009, and six died. Uh, six people died, unfortunately, in that fire. So you can see very different scenarios in terms of where compartmentation was successful and maybe where it wasn't necessarily quite so successful. So what are we looking at? Well, where is it required? Well, provision B3 requires compartmentation, resist the spread of fire, and enable, it, uh, enable escape, uh, and give the fire and rescue. So effectively, allows us to escape unhindered through heat, uh, fire or smoke and allows the emergency services to go in if they so wish to uh, and that's effectively the, the main provisional principle uh, of pacifier. In terms of regulation uh, it needs to meet the building regs so we have a series of building regs uh, ADB in England and Wales Scotland has its own technical handbook incidentally that example it, and it's probably a little bit small to read on this screen that's actually from the Scottish technical handbook Northern Ireland has its own, Ireland has its own, but they're all broadly the same in terms of the principles of it. So where's it required? Well, here's a typical overview of the plan. And the area is marked in red, so that's your stairwell, your elevators, anywhere that's the principal access point or egress point uh, would require a minimum of two hours. Anywhere which is effectively compartmentation between zoned areas would require one hour. So I'm going to hand you over now to Stephen Bond, uh, he's the chair of the Fire Resistant Glazing Group uh, and he's also a significant member of the team at Pilkington Glass UK. So Stephen, over to you. Okay. Are we on now? Can you hear me now? Good afternoon everybody, um, thank you for the introduction. As you can see I, I chair a group of the fire resistant glazing group of the GGF and uh, as Mike said I, I work for Pilkerton as my, as my day job. So just an introduction to the fire resistant glazing group. Um, although we're a glass association we have fire resistant glass manufacturers, we have intumescent seal manufacturers as members, we have installers, certification bodies, we, we have the fire test houses there, we have technical staff from the GGF and also uh, consultants and associates. So to uh, slightly repeating what, what Mike said earlier, um, so in the first instance why do we need to specify uh, fire resistant glazing? It's all about compartmentation, stopping the spread of flame from one side to the other and the guidance that gives us that um, what we need to, to specify is, is it an approved document B. So again, what do we want to try and do? We want to try and stop um, fire progressing from compartment to compartment. So for example here, we've got some horizontal and then vertical containments. And it, also what we want to do is protect life. So we don't want the fire to say to spread from the first, second or whatever floor it occurs. 
goes on to the associated floors, the next floors down or up. And if we look at examples of what we can do with glass in, in that respect, if you look on the left, we have a, a um, compartment between buildings, so not internally, but between buildings. So the responsibility of the building on the left is to spot, for it, spread a fire to the building on the right. So we have a facade that can give you some protection for fire resistance. And, and on the right, we have the horizontal protection where we can actually do glazed floors that allow protection from floor um, to floor. So you allow borrowed light to, to buildings below, or rooms below. Okay. So uh, talking about glass, I and mean, people probably think about glass as, as an inorganic material, an inert material. Uh, it doesn't burn, unlike some organic materials that, that we've seen in the past. So why do we need this specialist um, fire resistant glass? I think what we first have to do is go back to first principles, is understanding why general glass products and the performance when subjected to fire resistance um, and how they perform so we understand the need for the specialised product. So in the first instance we're having a, a kneel glass which is just the raw glass. This is what we call the glass that comes off the, the furnace and it is sent to uh, merchants to cut down. We have laminated safety glass, so that's the PVB interlayer type glass that's used in, in, in balustrades for instance or in, in, in any safety applications. We have toughened safety glass and then when we get to the bottom two here we have wire glass that is quite um, easily recognisable by the wires embedded in the glass but we also have clear fire rated glasses um, which to the eye look no different to other types of glasses that you'll see. So we'll explore the journey of how glass performs and then we can understand why we need these last two um, glasses. So. Firstly, we'll talk about how we achieve fire resistance. So we have to look at a fire test. So this is the standard time temperature curve that we follow. And if we look at annealed glass, we get annealed glass in there and it will break at 40 to 100 degrees temperature differentials. So that's very early on in the test. If we put two pieces of annealed glass together between a laminate into a PVB laminate, the glass will hold the glass together um, up to about 180 degrees and then they get reaction of the interlayer being organic and it starts to melt. And the important bit here we're talking about resistance to fire, not reaction to fire, if we were to contain the PVB laminate between especially uh, toughened glasses or toughened glasses, the performance is different to what you'll see in this video. This is two annealed pieces of glasses that you standardly get in, in um, buildings and if we look at how that behaves in the fire test, we'll just, just play this video and hopefully, I'm not so sure if you'll get the sound, but if you just, the sound's coming through. So, so this is a fire test furnace, this is a, an R&D tool that we use at Pilkington. So we've just put a, a non-fire resistant PVB laminate in here. So you hear the first crack of the glass. So the glass is still containing. Um, and then as, as the video moves on, you'll see the, the interlayer degrade. As you see here now, you see some sort of starring at the side and a slight bit of smoke coming through. So this is two minutes within to that fire test curve, three minutes coming up. And you can see how quickly this starts to degrade from, from a fire resistance point of view. So you've seen the flame, you've seen some igniting, that's on, on, on the fire side. And then you'll see in, in, in a second, stress this video was probably about 10 years old and, uh, and none, of, none of these guys over the cross side the health and safety guys are in here watching this at the moment so it's quite an old video that, that's um, there's no no PPE so we'll have all the health and safety jumping over the wall won't be in a minute so uh, so you can see a glass that is a safety glass not intended for fire how it does perform but in all intents and purposes it probably looks like a normal piece of glass okay if we move on to toughen glass, so if you use standard toughen glass and not there are modified toughens or advanced toughen glass available, these are stable to a higher temperature and but catastrophic will occur after about five minutes. So again, it's on auto play, so 
again, a smaller piece, somebody testing a what they was hoping is a, is a fire resistant glass, but it's, a, a, it's, it's normal toughened. So you can see as it slowed down, the glass breaks, very much like you see in, in standard safety glass in, in um, car side lights or, or bus shelters. So again, it is classified as a safety glass in terms of bodily impact, but not in terms of fire resistance. So to achieve classification to fire resistance, we need to conduct tests to these standards. Now, we, we, the, the time temperature curve is generally the same between the, the British standard and the European standards, and depending on which test you carry out, it depends whether you're doing doors or screens or floors. But these are the, the tests that you carry out. You then have to get a classification to the bottom standard, the EN 3501 part two. It's important to note that you cannot get that European classification from a British standard test. So you would get from this test, if it's a European test, a classification of the e, EW, EI or REI if you're using loaded floors. Where E is integrity, EW is, is, is integrity with radiated heat protection and EI is integrity and insulation and the REI is, is to do with the loading applied to the floor giving you integrity and insulation. So in quick summary, if you look down what I've just said is, is it, what I've just explained prior to the, prior, previous to this slide is integrity, integrity reduced heat and integrity and insulation. So integrity and insulation is, is the, the highest level of protection that we're given and if you look at how that's classified in simply in terms of a, an image, the one on the left is integrity and insulation, you can virtually put your hand onto the, onto the glass at a set time and on the right you've just got the integrity of the glass which shows the radiated heat or the conducted heat will ignite something in, in the vicinity. Um, depending on the, the time rating, we can produce glasses that are 30 minutes up to 180 minutes integrity and insulation. You would still be able to take that picture at 180 minutes if the glass was classified for 180 minutes on the left hand side. So, how do these glasses work? Some a very old clip art, but very general, and it's very basic um, science how they work. Multi-laminate glasses, gel interlayers in between, a bit of fire on one side, and as the fire heats through, because the interlayers are made up of a gel and a water based, it takes time to convert that water into steam. So all the energy goes into the water. So if you remember when he was back at school, and uh, you've got a Bunsen burner, you've got a beaker of water, you heat that beaker of water with the Bunsen burner, the temperature rises and rises, you get to 100 degrees, and no matter how much more you heat that water, the temperature does not go over 100 degrees. So what we're doing with these glasses are embedding water into these glasses by multi-layers. So all the energy is, is being uh, converted, is converting the water to steam and not through to the other side. So that's how we protect on the insulin for the integrity and insulation. So again, another video to show how quick this happens in terms of a fire. So we're going to run a test that, that follows the time temperature curve. In the top right hand corner, you have the temperature at the bottom you have the time. Uh, if I just run this, this you'll see how, how quickly these react. So we've got temperature nearly 100 degrees already after a minute or so. Two minutes with up to 400 degrees and you see the reaction of the, the intramescent very quickly and, and you see how that's starting to protect from the transfer of heat. So this is a, a 30 minute integrity of insulation glass and you can see after five minutes the glass is, is protecting from the heat coming through. So that maintains it. We could run the video on for the next 25 minutes, but that, that's all you'll see, is it, the whiteness in front of you. So you can see how it protects. And if, if that was, again, a 180 minute glass, it would be exactly the same appearance. So that hopefully indicates why we need special glasses and, and not just normal laminated glasses or, or safety glasses. So in terms of how we take that forward, so in terms of applications, they can put in, depending on test evidence and system test evidence, we can put this into fire doors, escape corridors, stairwells, roof lights, floors, 
So anywhere you put a solid wall, you can put glazing to, to satisfy the compartmentalisation. So, again, if we, if we look here, typical fire doors glazed with small areas. It doesn't have to be small areas. We as glass manufacturers like large areas of glass indoors. We don't like a lot of timber in there. We'd rather put a large amount of glass in there. And again, with walls, we like to put lots of glass in walls as well. So it gives you a feel, it opens up the building. And again, escape corridors, conventional, what looks like could be conventional partitioning and escape corridors can be fire rated glass. And that depends on the occupancy of the building and what's on the other side of the, of, of the the escape corridor if it's a dead end or stairwells or escape routes and again you can open up buildings by um, using glass in, in different types of applications 60 minute applications protecting supporting structure and if you look closely enough into here you're protecting stairways by by some sort of glass um, surround so again we mentioned horizontal applications we, we've showed the image of the, of the floor we, we do this we can open up and, and produce roof lights that protect from from fire from inside the building to the outside structure and, and all neighboring structures sorry about this a bit quick i'm trying to rush through this for, for, for the time um, just a quick we, we spoke about all these glasses looking the same and, and it's important and sometimes depending on who you're presenting to it, I touch on this and I think last time I did this presentation it, it went down quite well because it's about people understanding what, what we, how we identify these glasses and a lot of fire risk assessors and people who work in that business see this, this problem that you see in this picture. You've got two glasses of identical appearance but two quite distinct different performances. So just straight looking at the glass you cannot tell what its fire rating is. You're going to have to rely on what came with the documentation or more importantly what's on the stamp. So you could anybody you could take a guess of what's what's here but if you look at that the one on the right was an integrity 60 minute glass but on the right you had a, a book jointed um, frameless structure for 120 minutes but at first impression there was no indication what was what was there so how do we identify glasses so fire resistant glazing we have a stamp it's literally about a 30 mil diameter stamp and normally normally if installed correctly it's right in the bottom corner so you see people who are crawling along the floor late at night in hotels looking at doors in the bottom corner of glazing they're not drunk and then had a good night out they're probably people working in the glass industry wondering whose glass has gone into that door or whose glass they've used in the frame so this this small stamp will give you a, a standard a company name an impact rating that's all we're obliged to do under under regulation but good practice said should give a product name a european class for instance product code dispatch date may be factory or identification so as an example as, as glass manufacturers of the fire resistant glazing group these are an example of some stamps so we don't have a uniform stamp we all put slightly different things on our stamp but we do put the product standard on one thing to be um, to highlight is the product standard that you see on, on I'll use my, the example of my company's the EN14449 is the laminated product stamp. So you'll see that stamp on standard laminated glass as well. It's because it's that product family. You've got to do then a bit more digging and hopefully it helps you out with a name something like Pyro. So you think Pyro's got to be some sort of fire performance. And then you, you do a bit more research and you can find out actually the 3020 is indicative of performance for instance but it may not be the actual performance okay so we've talked about the glass we'll quickly talk about the systems the glass itself if put in and this is an analogy i've heard so many times if you've got a good glass and a bad frame or a good glass bad install a bad frame it's not going to work and vice versa so it's all about systems and we talk about glazing into systems frames and doors or whatever it's got to be a tested system and each element is as critical as the next even down to installation if the installation is poor all the good system and all the good work may go go to waste so everything is, a, is as crucial as the next so quickly looking at 
how this can affect fire resistant glasses in that respect. So we've got on the left hand side of this picture we've got a integrity only glass with a certified approved tape system versus a standard glazing tape that we would use. So as you can see on the right slightly at the top you can see a flame. So that appears to appear at 20 minutes so it doesn't actually get to the 30 minute mark that it was aiming for whereas the one on the right achieves 30 minutes. Now we're talking about systems if we take the same tape so the standard glazing tape but put a glass in that gives you a bit more so it gives you integrity and insulation or a bit more help and doesn't transmit the heat as much you can get to 37 minutes so it's all about getting the tested system correct and the compatible components together in your application so in, in summary the recommendations is check test evidence check assessments are in place for the system intended fire resistant glazing system that means glass frame and glazing system and use third-party accredited producers products installers when you well i would say when you can i think that should be a, a given um, although it, it, it's not in legislation at the moment. Okay, just a final couple of slides before I hand back to Mike. So I've told you about the theory and I've shown you some practice of how it should work. Does it actually work when we come to the event of a fire? Um, and I've got a couple of images here. If you look at the picture on the left, what we have there is a glazed screen with a double door and fan light. The fire in this instance was start to finish was eight hours long. We don't produce glass for eight hours, but in terms of fire, it's been exposed to quite a severe fire. And there's one thing you can take from this picture is if you look at the wall there, within a half a meter behind, there's timber that's untouched, uncharred, and protected from the glass. If you turn around 180 degrees from where that picture's taken, that's the seam that's behind that door. So that's the fire as it spread without the stopping the compartmentation of stopping. So that compartmentation of glass has stopped fire progression within half a meter. There's, it, it completely stopped. And you can see intensity of the fire, you've got twisted, twisted metal, twisted steel work. And again, the same building. On, I've got, the, sorry, the picture's slightly wrong way around. If you look on the right, any holes that you see are generally from the fire brigade knocking through. So if you look at the picture on the right, you can see how the glass has reacted. Um, you can see the greenery through, through the hole at the bottom right. But if you see on the other side, this is protecting the pool area. You can see how the glass has stopped the spread of heat through onto, and protected so that even the, even the trees or the greenery has not been affected by any of the heat coming through. So finally, um, for resources and information on, on fire resistant glazing, um, there's a public domain test that's available on the GGF website in, um, in the FRG section, FRGD section. It's called Getting It Wrong, Getting It Right, and it just puts fire resistant glass system on one side and one on the other with intumescence and all that what should be right and it shows you the difference and it shows within 10 minutes or so that you don't have a, a compartmentalization with the glass. Um, there's a best practice guide that goes through all the, all the basics of, of fire resistant glass and again as that is, is listed in approved document B that's free to download as well so that gives you an idea of, of manufacturers and, and glazing systems and how, how you can um, put glazing systems together. Now sit down then, if I'm honest. Um, great, uh, thanks, Stephen. I think um, thanks for that sort of can that canter through uh, fire rating, fire rating glazing. I think it's important to sort of just quickly qualify why fire rating glazing and fire curtains, which I'm going to come on to in a moment, um, is, is 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 you know there's a demand for it. Is that is that modern architectural design creates creates designs that create a, a demand for new ways of achieving fire compartmentation, protecting means of escape, boundary protection. I didn't, I didn't touch on boundary protection earlier on. Um, anything that effectively means that the fire needs containment and to protect people's ability to leave or to allow the emergency services to come in or to even protect property in itself uh, is important. But of course architects are constantly pushing the boundaries in terms of design which has been driven by clients. Environment. <laughs> it's actually quite ironic because I was just before the whole that, that rather bizarre thing called COVID-19 came along. Um, it, it, environment in buildings is important for attracting uh, quality employees. If you talk to any main recruiter in, in, in London, for an example, if you want to attract the right type of employee, you've got to create an environment that they want to work in. And certainly the tech companies like Google and a lot of these other 
other companies actually thought very seriously about how they were going to attract talent to, to office buildings. Um, I'm sure it'll come back, but it's probably not actually at the forefront of people's minds at the moment. Um, so we're going to move on to fire curtains, something that is actually, I, I have an admission, it's, it's very close to my heart because I was involved in the industry for a long time. Uh, since moved to the ASFP, and I wouldn't be at the ASFP if it wasn't for where I was before. So I thank uh, both parts of my life, <laughs> past and present, for that one. Um, so let's talk about fire curtains. What is a fire curtain? Well, it's a fiberglass woven uh, fabric uh, with stainless steel thread within the weave. It has special coatings on it. So for those of you who appreciate a good KFC, it's all about the coating. Uh, so, uh, and they, but they actually achieve the same result as what Stephen's been talking about, but they do it in a different way. Um, so here we've got a couple of examples. Uh, these are access stairs. Um, if any of you have been involved in, in projects where effectively um, a company will take over two or three floors of an office building, but actually the floors are floors 23 to 25, um, they need some form of internal access because they only want you going into the lowest floor they have and then you move around within it. And these are called access stairs. But of course, as soon as you create one of these, you're creating a penetration between occupied floors. So it has to be protected. Um, a lot of the time, the designers don't like lobbies. So lobbies aren't a bad thing, but, but lobbies are quite traditional. They're a non bearing wall, normally made of plasterboard or timber or some other form of compartmentation. And they protect things like staircases, elevator, uh, areas of ele elevator lobbies, anything that's effectively a penetration between floors, that's what they protect. But of course, it's quite a traditional method. So hotels is quite a good example. So you come out of your room, you go down in the lift, and you, you come out of the lift into a small little room uh, with a pull-up banner of Lenny Henry staring at you, telling you all about how great you know, Premier Inns are, and then you walk through a door and you're into the reception area. Um, that's not great from an environmental point of view. You know, they'd like you to come out of the lift and straight into the restaurant or straight into the bar. But of course you need that protection in terms of the fact that the elevator shaft is a penetration between the floors. So fire curtains came onto the, started to appear 25 years ago really, roughly now, as an alternative to traditional compartmentation. Either compartmentation you can't see through because it's a wall, or compartments that require doors or shutters, uh, or glazing. Uh, and, and sorry Stephen, I mean it's not, it's, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with glazing, it forms... Knives are out. <laughs> and, and of course, people like light. I mean environment, I went on about environment is very important. People like light, people like space, people want to use the internal space creatively, good circulation and create a nice environment. But of course the demands of approved document B, double nine double nine and, and for domestic weddings, double nine nine one, demands that you protect the means of escape and create comp compartmentation. So here's some more examples. Uh, here is a fast food joint, McDonald's, other burger, uh, burger joints are available. Uh, and here effectively what you're doing is you've got an open counter service. If there's a fire in the kitchen behind, you need to protect that in terms of the public area, which is in front of the counter. Curtain deploys, puts the separation back in. Here you have a horizontal example. Uh, that building, I think, throw something at me if I'm wrong, John. That's Arabs headquarters in London. Uh, they originally were the largest horizontal curtains ever created. Effectively, what Arabs didn't want was the balconies completely closed in. They wanted completely open balconies, so they had to create the compartmentation between the occupied spaces through a horizontal uh, fire curtain. Uh, so that's, that's that particular design. The little diagram below sort of explains where you can use fire curtains, but anywhere effectively where you have a, a, a traditional requirement for compartmentation is where a fire curtain would generally work. Um, right, uh, interesting point here is uh, the industry is, in the big scheme of things is, is, a, is a relatively new industry, and of course with anything relatively new, uh, trust was an issue. Uh, so the industry spent long and hard building trust, and, and that actually culminated a few years ago in the ASFP uh, delivering uh, Blabook uh, through the technical group 7. Uh, for those of you who are aware of the ASFP and our members, we, public, we create and publish technical guidance documents uh, which is created by our members and us and various third party uh, stakeholders in delivering best practice in products and or services. And for fire curtains, it is the Black Book. Um, it's readily available on the ASFP website. Uh, we, we do harvest your information when you download it for free. Um, but in 
terms of that, if you want a if you want a definitive guide on fire curtains, uh, the Black Book is certainly worth a, a nighttime read uh, if you're interested. Um, in terms of building rigs, um, means of escape, compartmentation, external fire spread, and firefighting access are all covered. Uh, the products are all covered under those particular um, uh, requirements, uh, and it's also covered in double nine double nine. We'll come on to double nine double nine and double nine nine one in a moment because I'll reference back to it when I come on to the product standard for for fire curtains. In terms, of how they, in terms of classification, Stephen mentioned 13501. Uh, you classify the product exactly the same way as you would uh, uh, glazing, uh, for instance. Um, what I would say is the fire curtain industry has, has evolved slightly differently. The fire curtain industry looked at where curtains delivered an alternative to a traditional solution and tested the product to that standard. So originally it was the old BS476, hands up who remembers BS476, of course we all do, uh, part 20, part 22, uh, and the old 31 part 1 uh, for smoke uh, resistance. Uh, that then turned into 1634, which was the European standard for uh, operable windows, shutters, doors, uh, which of course a curtain is, which then later turned into another standard which we'll come on to in a moment. But effectively the principles are the same. Integrity, resistance to flame or fire, uh, resistance to heat, energy, that's an EW classification, or insulation, the old below a certain temperature on the face, or smoke resistance in an ambient condition. Now with doors, normally you would measure a door effectively around uh, where the uh, frame or the door lift sits within the frame. Uh, and it has to be below a certain leakage rate. Well, fire curtains are exactly the same because it, in some cases, a fire curtain will replace a section of wall which may have a door in it, and therefore the curtain is expected to perform to the same principle as the door and the section of wall. So there's the smoke. So effectively, ambient condition. It's under the um, standard, the European standard now, 1634 part three. Uh, they do a, a, effectively an ambient pressure test and then measure the leakage uh, in terms of the, the, uh, the leakage between the curtain, head box, and the side guides. Uh, you have to stay below three cubic meters per linear meter per hour on a three by three sample. So all the checks and balances are there. Checks and balances actually originally existed before the product because effectively the product replicates. Uh, uh, the, the, those products that went before. So as Stephen alluded to, that's what a European classification would look like. Uh, so 180 minutes integrity, 30 minutes resistance to radiation. Uh, the measure for that is below 15 kilowatts per square meter per hour. At a distance, you have to declare the distance of the radiometer, and you always use the center meter of it. Uh, and then C1, that's the number of cycles. Fire curtains have a cycle operation. Uh, you have to cycle test it to so many cycles because normally a fire curtain in a normal condition you may want to test it once a week take out a couple of weeks for holidays that's 50 times a year so if it's done 500 cycles that's that's replicating 10 years worth of testing on that curtain things like deflection curtains will deflect into an escape room normally no more than about 150 mil even the really big ones don't deflect much more than that but the deflection zone has to be uh, taken into account little trick little tip for you here um, if you want to turn the headbox around so the curtain comes off the roller on the occupied or the room side not the corridor side and that will gain you about 100 120 150 mil Escape routes, a couple of measures, so if you're replacing a wall or a door with a section of a fire curtain, there's a couple of things to consider, and, the, and there is good manufacturers have it configurated for this. This is the width of the curtain, so the distance you travel past the curtain, how far away you are from it, and how quickly you're travelling. And you take effectively those three different factors, and then you apply that to the test results you've got in terms of the performance of the curtain, uh, in terms of the tests that you did on it uh, against the standard for that is 1363. So that's something, again, glazing would replicate. Um, so good manufacturers will have a configurator in terms of fire curtains protecting a means of escape and its performance in terms of limiting energy uh, so that you're not exposed to too much energy as you walk past it. Um, information for designers. In the Black Book, there is a, a series of pages which talks about how curtains interact with other systems. So um, ASFP is, is, a, is a passive fire uh, 
trade association. Uh, but what ASFP would never say is, is that you shouldn't use other products or services or, or, or methods. And in this particular case, in, a, in an apartment here where you've got a fire curtain protecting the, the means of escape, uh, you've got an open area to the living room, and the living room effectively, uh, uh, the sofa catches fire, uh, the curtain closes. Um, the best solution for that in a domestic dwelling would probably be a fire curtain, if you want it open plan, and a sprinkler system. So a sprinkler starts to control the fire, the curtain closes, and you leave your bedroom and leave your apartment. So curtains, like all other solutions in terms of fire protection and fire safety, normally the best solution are the best products and services and methodologies for the building concerned and the people that are in it and what that use of the building is. So just looking at in terms of testing, um, we'll come on to, there's a standard called BSA 524. BSA 524 was published in 2013, it's currently in review. The British Standard Committee that sit on BSA 524 are resitting at the moment. I, I want to stress BSA 524 in terms of fire curtains. It's a product standard, but not only that, it's actually a certified scheme. Uh, there is a scheme, there are uh, UCAS accredited scheme providers, so uh, in terms of your, uh, I think the scheme provider for this scheme is IFC, International Fire Consultants, um, and they support the scheme through third party accreditation. But there are nine annexes that you have to test to or achieve to be compliant to BSA 524. Some of those tests don't actually exist in the standards that would normally support the product. Uh, one of them is a, is a motor test, and I'll very quickly just touch on this. So some fire curtains can be very tall. I'm two meters tall, although I'm actually shrinking uh, based on my age. If you've got a fire curtain that's six meters tall, the motor that operates that curtain could be in a very different environment than where you're standing on the finished floor. And if the fire curtain is somewhere in a void and it's affecting that motor, and you go to leave through that curtain, because curtains can be open, you know, open and closed like a fire door, if you go to walk through that curtain and the motor has been affected because the fire is actually in an environment that you may not be aware of, that curtain is not going to work. So one of the annex testers for Act 524, which was created by the Standards Committee, is that you have to furnace test independently the motor for a fire curtain. So if it is exposed to a fire condition outside of the fire that may be in the building, it should work because it's been manufactured and tested in a way that means it will operate. So 8524 is a, it's a product third party scheme made up of standards that you may be aware of, 1634, 1363, 1634 part 3 for smoke, and also additional tests which the industry recognises are unique to the product. So um, it's a supported standard, it's a two part scheme, one is the product, two is a code of practice for the specification, installation, service and maintenance of the product. In terms of the product itself, fire curtains are, are very uh, interactive and intelligent. There's a whole series of different things you can interface with them. You can either put them into the alarm, you can put them on local detectors, you can have a combination of both. They can work on single lock, double lock. You can have push to trap buttons to lift them up and they close behind you. Uh, you can have fireman's override. You can interface them in various different ways. They also have a series of safety features where if the wiring is corrupted, the curtain will still come down under controlled descent. Um, or what, uh, rather than coming down as a guillotine, or overrides the fact that it won't come down at all. Uh, because, for instance, the speed or the operation of the deployment of the curtain is governed, so if it's above two metres, you can operate at, I'm desperate to remember, uh, at 300 mil per second, and if it's below two metres from head height, it'll only operate at about 150 mil per second. They operate under what we call gravity by descent. That means they, they don't power down. They come down under gravity, but they're in a controlled descent uh, method. So there's a whole series of fail saves in fire curtains that have been built in, which is covered by BSA 524. So, in terms of what we feel, or what the ASFP feels, why do we need to certify products? Well, you can self-declare, but actually, you know, I think we've all moved on from self-declaration. I wouldn't imagine there's any specifier or principle to an order that would be wholly comfortable with accepting self-declaration. There's a test report. Um, hands up, who can read a test report and be really confident, thank you Mr. Taylor, that they actually understand what it says? Yeah, minority. If I gave you a test report for a fire I guarantee 99% of you, you wouldn't actually understand most of it. 
However, under a third party scheme, a third party, a UCAS accredited uh, body, has assessed that manufacturer against their test reports and has issued a certificate on their behalf for them to use to their customer to say, yeah, this company, they've done all tests in relation to the standard and they've achieved them. And as the UCAS underwriting body for this scheme, we're saying they're compliant. So somebody else has done all the hard work. At the ASFP, we are absolute adv advocates of third party certification. So, in terms of self declaration, I would say probably not. Uh, for any specifiers, people with principal design responsibility, or even principal contractors, if there's any of you here, uh, I'll leave that one with you. Uh, test reports, the same. If you can evidence uh, competency in being able to understand what it is you're reading and make, back, make a specification or an acquisition decision on the basis of that test report, again, there is an element of risk. The party certification, it does have a significant amount of parachute built into it uh, in terms of a third party saying that actually they underwrite it. Those are the, under, those are the various certifying bodies. Um, from a membership point of view, ASFP, lots of, uh, most of the uh, uh, pacifier manufacturers now growing quite a few of the uh, pacifier specialist uh, subcontractors in terms of installation. But we've always had a very healthy relationship with the certifying bodies, most of which are members of the ASFP and contribute greatly to the work that we do. So, in terms of uh, documents, uh, as Stephen alluded to, there's the Glass and Glazing Federation Guide to Best Practice in the specification and use of fire rated glazing systems. Uh, or in, uh, and, the, uh, and for the fire curtains, a slightly shorter title, Black Book. Um, so, both of those are available, you can download them, or you can contact the GTF or the SFP and we can make them available to you. Um, so, just to allude back onto where we were before. Um, Modern architectural design is creating these demands for solutions. Uh, we see this as a really important part of uh, uh, effectively uh, allowing people to create uh, you know, interesting designs and buildings and keeping them compliant from a fire safety point of view. Uh, but what we would say is if you're going to specify any products or services to do with passive fire products, in terms of these that Stephen and I have spoken about, please make sure they fall under a third party certified scheme.